Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, um, being a medical doctor, of course, I, it's an honorary title. I don't have a PhD, so um, but you can call me Wayne, that's fine. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about Caridon Observatory. I am a haematologist by day, um, and I'm an astronomer by night. I have been into astronomy since I've been knee-high to a donkey, um, and I love the subject pretty much as much as I love medicine. So um, I'll talk to you about who we are. Um, where we are, um, you might, you know, you've heard now that there is this thing, Caridon Observatory. We'll talk to you a bit about the background. What do we do as, uh, as an outreach observatory? Um, what have we done so far? Why do we do it? And what are our future plans? So um, without further ado, here we are. Uh, we're not a big crew. And in fact, half of that crew isn't um, related to Caridon Observatory. There's obviously me on the left. Uh, there's a couple of councillors. The chap with a beard, it looks like a sort of a less aged Father Christmas. That's Mike Wilmot. Um, Mike, it was great. BBC uh, Spotlight came over one day and they wanted to interview us for the TV. And uh, I was standing next to Mike and uh, the chap said, no disrespect, Wayne, but he looks like an astronomer. We'll put him on the television. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and he is absolutely great. I mean, if you, if you get to hear Mike, if you get to see Mike, um, he's so passionate about his subject. He's a really good talker. He's very good at inspiring kids, and that's uh, about what, what he does. Um, Ken and Muriel there. Ken built the observatory with Muriel, his wife, um, to, to his right, um, with no funding. He did it all off his own back. He, he um, used to be uh, a nuclear fitter at Devonport Dockyard. He then became a pig farmer, uh, and this is the site of the old pig farm. So he ripped out the styes, and uh, now he put some observatories in. The pigs are gone. They weren't terribly interested in astronomy. <laughs> um, and that's Mike, um, who's Ken's son, and his um, other son and daughter. And Mike did a lot of the work for um, taking the wide field photographs that we use for um, the dark sky application for Bob Moore. I'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, but Mike does lots of really good um, wide field photography with, um, with telephoto lenses and some modified um, cameras and that kind of thing. Uh, he's chap in the middle. So where are we? Well, I thought I'd show you this image because uh, it's a really good um, snapshot from the CPRE, which um, highlighted the light pollution problem that we have throughout the world and indeed throughout um, the UK. Uh, the red and the orange and the greeny bits, that's where we've got the maximum area of light. And you can see Exeter, you can see the blight that is Plymouth. <laughs> <laughs> and between the two, you've got Dartmoor. And that blob in the middle is lovely Princetown and the prison. Um, but then to the, to the sort of 10 o'clock of Plymouth, we've got Bobman Moor. And then above that, you can see Exmoor. Uh, and they're very comparable in terms of the um, amount of light that's coming out from those areas. And the observatory is on the southeastern edge of that um, green ring, which demarcates um, the moor. So we're right on the edge of the moor. So we've got a really, really dark site. Um, interestingly, I'm involved with a group that are also trying to do the same with Dartmoor, but I'm, I'm not taking uh, so much of an active role in that. I took quite an active role in the, in the Bob Moor one. Um, and that's obviously from Google. Thanks, Google. Um, anybody been to the Hurler Stone Circle? Do go there. It's a lovely place. You can walk up onto the moor from there. Um, it's fantastic. And just up from that, we are sighted. We're situated. So I've said already what our background is. Well, um, Ken is the nuclear fitter and ex-pig farmer. He's not an astronomer. Um, he will openly admit he knows very little about astronomy. Um, he just wanted to give something back to educational outreach. He thought, OK, what can I do? OK, I'll build some observatories. To be fair to him, he does know a bit. He's managed to pick up a bit over the years. And Mike and I just talking at him constantly about astronomy. He will pick up a little bit by osmosis. Um, and Mike is the astronomer and educator. He, um, he works at um, Liscard School. He does a GCSE course in, um, uh, in astronomy. He also does some uh, supply teaching as well. But uh, he's a fantastic educator. Um, and with him coming on board, uh, that was great. I joined at a later stage. I joined a little bit later, um, uh, about a year and a half, two years after they'd originally set up. Um, so that's me down at the bottom, the haematologist and uh, amateur astronomer, Mike. Uh, Ken's son is a computer software designer, so he's done a lot of uh, work with the web 
page. We have pages that we've got related to Carrot and Observatory. Um, and uh, now, to begin with, again, he wasn't, um, he wasn't so much of an astronomer, but we've managed to hit him with the bug. Poor chap. OK, so what have we got? Well, we, it used to be a pig farm, so we've cleared out all that. Um, it's now got four fixed domes. They're about 2.2 meters in diameter. They're, you know, sort of classic, classic domes with a shutter. We've got a temporary dome, um, which um, ha is a hemi-dome, so it flips back and re reveals one half. We've got a lecture room. Uh, we've obviously now got the dish. Thanks, chaps and chapesses. Um, and we've got a holiday home, so it's really great there. <laughs> and so, you know, you can stay up there all night, kip out somewhere. It's brilliant. Um, so that's the temporary dome. It's got an EQ5 um, equatorial mount, and it's got my little Williams optics on it. Uh, you probably can't see the camera on the back, but it's got an ordinary off-the-shelf Canon EOS camera, but what we do is take the um, filter off so that we can allow hydrogen alpha um, wavelengths through, so that it's modified in some way. But essentially, it's an off-the-shelf camera, and we can get some really fantastic wide-field images. And behind that, you can see the domes um, and that's the first dome, dome one. And then they're stretched out. This is from one of our outreach days, um, April a couple of years ago. Um, you can see the aperture of one of the domes is open. So at any one time, if, if we had, you know, if we had um, all of the telescopes working, we could, in theory, um, observe multiple objects. We tend to focus on one particular um, dome and one particular imaging run at any one time. Uh, this is Mike in our lecture room. We've got the obligatory blackout curtains, which is fantastic. I think that is, oh, it projects better. That's probably Uranus, or is it Neptune? That's on the magic planet. If, if you, have you ever seen the magic planet? It's brilliant. Kids love it. If they know they're going to get the magic planet, they think, great. And the thing about the magic planet is it shows the topography of the planets and the moons in really great detail. But, you know, if you're talking to kids about Europa, and we all want to talk about Europa to them, clearly. We can actually show it to them. We can show the pictures from NASA. It's projected on the inside of this dome, and it really switches them on that they can hear about it, but they can also see it as well. So um, that's what that thing does, the, the Magic Planet. And Mike uses that as part of his educational sort of program. So what do we do? Well, we've obviously got the domes, um, and our primary aim is to inspire people of all ages, no matter how old, how young, you, you know, that's, that's what we do. Mike is the key educator. Um, as I say, he's the GCSE uh, astronomy um, guy. Um, and we use Magic Planet. I joined a bit later. And my background was from um, imaging and outreach. I'd done quite a bit of outreach in the past. I'm quite used to standing up and talking to lots of people from my normal job anyway. So I'm quite happy to sort of talk to hundreds of people about um, medicine or astronomy. Uh, so, but I, I, my main aim is to take, take images. I'm an imager by, um, by trade, if you like. I tend not to look down telescopes these days. I tend to sort of bolt the camera on the back. One of the things which you do do, which is a regular thing which we do, is we partake in GCSE images for those GCSE students. So they have a defined coursework. And what we do is we give them an imaging list, which has got about 20, 25 um, objects on it. They're mainly from the sort of classical Messier or NGCs. Um, and they choose three or four objects um, that they will obviously learn about. They request them. We then supply them with the images. Now, what we don't do is we don't supply them with perfect images. You know, we don't want them to get the brilliant ones, which you know, go, wow, isn't that great? We want them to see ones which you know, they can talk about it. They can say, OK, maybe if I took narrowband imaging, maybe if I added some hydrogen alpha, maybe if I took a little bit less red or blue, that kind of thing, that they can, they can talk about how the image is acquired and how it can be potentially improved upon. But what we try and do is we try and take at least about an hour of um, LRGB. So we've got, um, we've got a camera. I'll show it to you in a minute. But um, essentially, it'll, it, it's, uh, it's broadband. We do have hydrogen alpha, but we tend to co focus on broadband because it's much easier for the students to appreciate um, the colors associated with that. Because, of course, narrowband, you will then assign an arbitrary color, um, like the Hubble palette, for example. Never really fully understood why hydrogen alpha becomes green. But there you go. It apparently looks prettier. 
But this is the scope, this is the, um, the equatorial mount that we use. It's just a simple thing. You, you can buy it in uh, First Light Optics just down the road, uh, Celestron uh, CGMDX. Um, it's computer controlled and it's got our telescope sat on the top of it. Um, and our telescopes are there. We've got um, the main imaging one is the one with the little red bit of gaffer tape on it uh, holding the, um, holding the um, uh, uh, shield over the front. Uh, that's an uh, eight-inch uh, Richie Shretian uh, made by Vixen um, and behind it is a filter wheel and then behind that is an S-Big 8.3 megapixel camera which cools down to about minus 45 below ambient and then in front of that we've got 80 millimeter mead on a mount mover um, with um, a nice bit of ash damping, a bit of wood dampens down the vibrations really well. <laughs> and then there's a little guiding camera at the back. So essentially the guiding camera, obviously I'll focus on a, a star, guide on that star, and then the main imaging rig um, will take the image. And then right down at the bottom is an e-finder. It's a cool camera neck uh, bolted onto um, a telephoto lens. Um, and that allows us to um, you know, um, fine tune where we're looking. So this is what I mean. We use something called PHD, which is push here dummy. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Um, essentially what it does is just after a few clicks of a mouse, it will say, you will say, okay, I want to, I want to um, use one of those stars to do my tracking. So you click on the star, it does a few movements, it then knows what the movement is, and then it keeps the keeps the start. You probably use exactly the same thing, but you probably don't call it push here dummy, but you will use something very similar to track your telescopes. So the eFinder is PHD1, and that one is the little tiny um, guider scope, which essentially, anybody know what that is that we're looking at? If I tell you it's the trapezium right in the middle? You are bloody astronomers, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's Messier 42 of the Orion Nebula. Anyway, the Orion Nebula, so it's focusing on the Orion Nebula. Um, and then when you take about a 90 minute image, you'll get something like this. This is LRGB, this is Messier 51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, beautiful interacting galaxy. You can see the effects of the gravity waves um, on the two of them interacting and clearly one day that little fella is going to be eaten by the big fella um, and it will probably turn into an elliptical galaxy, I think. Now. Um, I wanted to show you this because, you know, one of the things about showing a picture like that, especially to kids, is they go, wow, can I have a look? And you go, oh, you're in for a bit of a shock. <laughs> you get out your big telescope, which is that one, which is uh, Dobsonian, which is 12 inches across. This was from a recent outreach event in Sibley Back, which is the lake you can see in the background. Um, and it's a Dobsonian, it's 12 inches across the mirror, and that's the one which we get people to have a look through. And the, only the other day we were showing lots of people the Whirlpool Galaxy, and I've kind of, I've seen the Whirlpool Galaxy a lot through the telescope, and that's kind of what you'll see. You won't see it looking like that, you'll see it looking like that. So you will see the sort of aggregations of the main sort of nuclei of the, of the galaxies, but you won't be able to see the fine structure that you can on images. So images kind of help, but they don't tell the full story, do they? And if you that's actually six and a half hours duration of image. Uh, that's Bode's Galaxy or Messier 81. And again, it's uh, LRGB, no hydrogen alpha, no narrowband. Um, and the beauty of being at Caradon is, is, of course, that I don't have to subtract an awful lot of light pollution. So I can process the images, and because there's not that sort of noise associated with light pollution, I get better contrast. So I can tease out the finer details uh, of the image um, from that. So this um, is after the telescope image a whole load of people turned up, 150 people um, turned up at our last outreach event, which is fantastic. All very polite, queuing to look down the telescopes. Uh, kids, older people, you know, lots of people turned up. Um, we advertised it through Facebook, and um, it's brilliant, honestly. It, I, I love this side of what I do. I love you know, the fact that I can talk to kids and people of lots of different ages and I can show them things that they've never seen before down a telescope. 
and uh, you know mostly it's wows sometimes it's oh is that it <laughs> <laughs> as a chap you don't want oh is that it do you so um, you know no um, but it's great because you know it gets people outside but not only that it gets people to appreciate the beauty of the night sky but then there are other things which you can bring on board as well and that's part of the things which you do related to outreach and I'll talk to you a bit briefly about that. Um, that's um, some chap looking clearly not uh, during the night looking at some stars but he's looking at Kit Peak. Um, it's not Kit Peak, uh, Kit Hill which is about Kit Peak miles away. Uh, Kit Hill is uh, just by Callington which is just across the, just across the valley. Um, and um, one of your um, colleagues who graduated, um, or some couple of your colleagues graduated a couple of years ago in that image looking down our solar scope. And what have we done? Well, we were, we were the team that helped put together the, um, the data, the information, and if you like, the astronomical aspects to this dark sky landscape um, application. So Bob Memoir is an international dark sky landscape or an international dark sky park. There are very few throughout the whole of the world. We're lucky we have one on Bodmin Moor um, with Cornwall County Council. Um, Carradine Observatory collaborated to get the application and this was successful last year. Um, so, and that photo that I showed you of Ken and the councillors, that was on the day that the um, press release went out that said we got the application uh, and that's through the International Dark Sky Association. So the International Dark Sky um, Association are a, are a group based in Tucson, and um, essentially their aim is the same as our aim, it's to help maintain the heritage, the beauty of the night sky for this generation and for future generations. Um, but there are also some tangible benefits alongside that. So that was the press release on the IDA website. Uh, and as I say there, you know, we're, we say that the night sky is at one of our own natural beauties of the world, so we have a duty to try and maintain it that way. And how do they work? Well, you know, it helps people to appreciate the wonders of the sky, but for sure, you have a dark sky park, it will draw in ecotourism. You know, they, we know that from Exmoor, Northumberland. Um, but if you can get people switched on to this idea of appreciating beauty, then you can help them to try and keep it that way as well. And you know, also helping them to understand that the light which they're using for no particular purpose, um, it's wasted energy and they'll save some money as well. And those are the things which really do get people, not, not people like you and I, but the people who make you know, the rules, the laws they listen to that kind of thing. You tell them they're going to save money, they love it. You show them a picture of Messier 51, they couldn't give a toss. But you tell them they're going to save money, fantastic, they love it. But also, if you tell them there are detrimental effects on humans, nobody likes that kind of stuff. And the evidence is now mounting up that light at the wrong time of day is detrimental to human health. And it's detrimental to wildlife and the landscape as a whole. So what are the risks? Well, there are absolutely no risks at all in doing this kind of stuff. That's a picture that Mike took in Hartford, and that's a picture that he took, same conditions, down in Bodmin Moor. Um, you can just appreciate Orion there with London in the background, and we've got a little bit of lights from a, a local village nearby, but essentially they are completely different, are they not? So our aims really help people appreciate the beauty of the night sky, try and get them to think about those really deep questions, the kind of questions that you bring up, you know, how did we get here, you know, how did the stars, the planets, how did all of that happen? Um, we haven't got the answers, that's what you're here for. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, as I said before, you know, we're just there to help people to appreciate the beauty and try and keep it that way. So we're going to continue our outreach program, we're going to continue to collaborate with you. Um, we are in the process, we formed a community interest company, we are in the process of applying for funding for our own magic planet, the current one belongs to Liscard School, a mobile planetarium that we can use in those times which, you know, when the clouds are there, when it's raining for example, um, a more automated telescope which makes it much easier to find objects and show people um, as best detail as we possibly can. And then the, the main one which we will go for, which will take a little while, is a fixed telescope, a Rishi Shretian, 
um, essentially a big imaging rig based at the observatory that will be able to facilitate sort of networking over the internet. So that will be a main aim. And that's another picture of the magic planet, not with Mike, as you can probably see. And, <laughs> and that's the kind of imaging rig which we'd kind of love to have. And yeah, we will. So why do we do it? Well, we do it for this kind of thing. You know, this was posted on our Facebook page. And, um, you know, this is the kind of thing which helps us uh, go along. But also, you know, being able to take pictures like this. Uh, you know, I, I love what I do during the day. But when I look at pictures like this, I love this. This is, this is the kind of thing which really, I didn't think one day that I'd be able to do these kind of things. So here's the Iris Nebula, the Silver Slither, the Horsehead Nebula, Jupiter, and of course the Great Orion Nebula, all taken with our equipment at Caradon Observatory. It's pretty simple stuff. It's not massively expensive stuff, but if you've got passion, if you've got commitment, uh, that's really what it, what it takes. So thank you. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I don't think I've overrun. No, I've done all right. Thank you very much. <laughs>